Good afternoon, everyone. This is Geraldine Burton with the McSilva Institute, along with the Community Technical Assistance Center and Managed Care Technical Assistance Center. And I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, EMS and High Needs Students Applying a Trauma-Informed Response in New York City Public Schools. The McSilva Institute, CTAC, and McTech have partnered to launch this multi-platform online series intended to help clinicians, Clin clinical professionals, community health workers, educators, policymakers, and any and all who influence our healthcare system to think critically about those social factors that have a direct and indirect impact on an individual's health and mental health. Throughout the series, we will bring into focus the linkage between poverty, racial disparities, and health inequalities and discuss ways in which these issues can be addressed to improve health outcomes for all. Before we get started, I want to take a moment to orient everyone to the WebEx system so you know how to participate in today's event. Number one, please note upon joining the webinar, you have been placed on mute to avoid any background noises that may distract others from listening to the presentation today. Number two, if you come across any technical issues during today's event, please chat to the host, Brianna, who will be able to assist you. Number three, you will have the opportunity to submit questions for the Q&A portion of today's presentation by utilizing the chat box feature, which is located on the right-hand side of your screen. If it is not visible, click the dialog bubble on the top right toolbar and it should appear. And number four, in order to ensure that we are able to answer as many questions as time permits, we are requesting that you send in your questions at any point during the webinar, and we will address them during the Q&A portion of today's webinar. With that being said, we are very excited to have Tara Foster and Nelson Marr, Senior Attorneys from the Legal Services New York City with us today. Tara Foster is the Senior Attorney for the Education Rights Project of Queens Legal Services. She has litigated in federal and state courts and before numerous administrative bodies. She provides trainings and workshops for parents, students, service providers, lay advocates and community-based organizations, and members of the bar on a variety of civil rights, disability rights, and education topics, and provides group and individual advice and representation to low-income families. Nelson Marr is a senior staff attorney and education law specialist at Bronx Legal Services. His practice includes both education law and social security disability law, with prior experience in labor, employment, and community economic development. Over the last 15 years, Nelson has represented hundreds of families in administrative proceedings before the Social Security Administration and the New York City Department of Education. He has represented initial clients in a wide range of educational law issues, including special education services, bullying, 504 services, student suspensions, and school safety transfer. Once again, thank you for joining us. And at this time, it gives me great pleasure to turn it over to Tara and to Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Next Geraldine. Slide. Thank you, Geraldine. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everyone. It's, it's a distinct pleasure for myself and Tara to be um, presenting this webinar to you this afternoon. Um, this is an important issue, uh, one that covers uh, a practice that has been fairly common in the New York City public schools over the last uh, 15 to 20 years, and which led us to a lawsuit and to changes and hopefully pushing the New York City Department of Education towards a more trauma-informed um, practices. So let me first start off by talking about um, some of the, the statistics about the New York City public school system. I'm sure many of you are probably familiar with it, but I, for those that aren't, you know, New York City public school system is the largest in, in the country. There's over 2,000 schools, over 1.1 million students, and a large percentage of those students live in poverty, um, and a significant number of those students are also students with disabilities, upwards towards 20%. Uh, 
Um, in New York City school system, like many other school systems, one of the persistent issues is student discipline. Um, in New York State, schools have a wide range of disciplinary responses. Some of them involve guidance interventions. Some of them involve removals from the classroom to um, other places within the school building. Then there's suspensions. And if it's a criminal matter, um, schools can call police and arrest a student. And what we're going to talk about today is schools using emergency medical services to respond to students who are, who are being disruptive. <clears throat> Discipline obviously is a big issue right now in, um, in education circles and, and in the public discourse. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about high disproportionality in uh, suspension rates, especially for black and African American students and students with disabilities. Um, thankfully, uh, in New York City, those numbers have been on the decline in terms of overall suspensions, but the disproportionalities remain. Um, students with disabilities continue to be suspended at almost twice the rate that they are in the population, and, um, and that's similarly the case for black and African and American students. Um, this is of significant concern because uh, student discipline uh, has shown to have significant impacts on a student's ability to graduate on time, and, and there's been studies about how students who are uh, disproportionately suspended wind up getting tracked to um, have higher incidences of being involved in the criminal justice system, all part of the school to prison pipeline. Um, and there are also a significant number of arrests and summonses in the New York City public school system. The, the data that we have um, most recently available is for the 14-15 school year, and um, there were about 283 arrests. Um, interestingly enough, uh, the use of emergency medical services actually uh, is, is at a far, far higher number than the number of students who are arrested. And, and this practice has been a common practice for a long time now in the New York City public schools. Um, us advocates who have been working in, in this field for, for during this time often see this as just a, another stop on the schools to prison pipeline. And unfortunately, this practice had been increasing um, over the last decade, especially in the prior mayoral administration. Um, let's step back a little bit and talk about what is a common scenario that we've seen in, in these cases where a student does get sent to the hospital emergency room. Um, oftentimes, in, in our clients' cases, it's, it's typically a young student. And that young student um, comes to school oftentimes already having a bad day, and then something happens, they, they get involved in, in a situation with another student or, or um, is not listening to the commands of the teacher, and when the school staff intervenes, um, student doesn't respond, and oftentimes the intervention by the school staff escalates the situation. Um, and, and once the student gets escalated, becomes more dysregulated, school administrators then um, <clears throat> reach for the phone, unfortunately, as, as often the first instinct to call for 911 if they can't um, calm that child down. Uh, and so typically schools call 911 in the hopes of, A, getting someone to, especially in New York City, get, get someone to restrain the child, but also because they think the child may need a psychiatric assessment. Um, in addition to sending the child off to the hospital emergency room, they often tell the parent that the student cannot return to class or to school until, there's, uh, until the parent gets a medical clearance letter uh, saying that the child can do so. Um, so I, I'm going to pull up a video here uh, that basically shows a, a common situation where something like this did occur. And uh, this video here, uh, is in a middle school lunchroom, and basically uh, a principal is trying to get a student to go to a lunchroom detention. He had been given lunchroom detention the day before, uh, according to my client. Uh, he, he says that he was crumpling a bag of potato chips, and because the noise of it was so loud, the principal was upset and said he had to serve detention. He felt it wasn't fair, 
And so um, on the day, on this day, as the video will show, he was not going to go to the detention, to, to the lunchroom detention. So, so let me play the video for you now, and you'll see um, it's towards the upper um, upper middle corner. It's it's a little hard to make out, but. Um, See if this is working here. Okay, so um, you'll see a lot of students moving across from right, from left to right. Those are the students leaving the table. Um, you see a school safety agent walking at the top of the frame, talking to the um, principal who goes over to the student and trying. The school safety agent is trying to get the student to to go with her to leave to go to lunchroom detention. And that's the principal walking around the table. Um, and you'll see now she'll approach back to the actual table where um, the student is. And it's at this moment that she actually escalates the situation. And you'll see the, the student then get further dysregulated. And right now, the principal is pretty much in his face and pointing her finger at him. And he gets upset, he gets up. The school safety agent, obviously alarmed, tries to grab him and he pushes back to push her off. And at this point, um, the school safety agent, by training, has to place him under arrest. And also, um, they eventually called 911 for emergency medical services as well. So, um, so that that I think exemplifies a typical situation where school staff um, clearly uh, did not address the situation where a student was was misbehaving in a way that. Um, de-escalated situation or, or got the child to comply in a manner that didn't um, cause him to get further dysregulated. Um, my next slide here shows uh, what a emergency medical service technician um, jotted down on his patient care report when he responded to one such call for, for another client of mine. And um, the big takeaway here is that, as you, as you can see on this slide, there's nothing really overtly serious or, or an emergency on this document. Um, the, the chief complaint is that he's very aggressive. Um, and, and he was, when, when EMTs got to the school, he was in no obvious trauma and he was in no obvious distress. But yet he was taken to the hospital emergency room anyway. Um, so, this, as I mentioned before, is, is not a new thing. This has been going on for at least um, 15 years. Back in 2004, there was some media uh, articles about this. Uh, it got into the news largely because emergency, medical, emergency room doctors, uh, these medical doctors, were concerned that they were seeing so many kids in their hospital emergency rooms and largely being sent there because they were um, being disruptive or having um, a behavioral incident. Um, and over the years, since 2004, there have been other articles that made the news where children as young as five were handcuffed and taken to the hospital emergency room. Um, so when we talk about this practice, um, there, there are significant impacts um, to taking a child to the hospital emergency room. Um, certainly, there's the traumatic effect on both the student and the parent. Um, and as many of you who are mental health providers know, this is probably the, the least, uh, the, the, the most ineffective way to introduce a child to um, mental health services. Uh, as, as this type of action oftentimes, you know, creates animosity, erodes any trust between the parent may have with the school, and then um, erodes any trust that the parent may have with first responders as well. At the same time, there's also a significant uh, financial cost to these removals. Um, as many of you know, 
there's about an $800 cost for the transport by the ambulance, and then hospital emergency room treatment is about $1,600. So if you take an average of $2,400 a trip and multiply it by roughly what, what we saw in our data, about 3,500 calls a year, that's about $8.4 million um, associated with this type of, um, of response to dis disruptive students. Um, that doesn't account for the lost productivity that, that these types of referrals um, also involve. You have school staff being pulled away from um, things that they would normally be doing, parents who are employed having to take um, emergency leave. Sometimes uh, some of our clients, the parents wound up being disciplined at their workplace because they were leaving so often. Um, and then there's the emergency medical service technicians who are responding to a disruptive child being taken away from maybe responding to someone with a broken arm or a heart attack or some, some more important medical condition. <clears throat> so this issue became um, really, really uh, extreme by 2010, 2011. We were seeing it in many of our client intakes. We were also hearing from many of you. Um, in, in the community, uh, different mental health providers, different community organizations who were saying that, uh, A, they were seeing a lot of kids being um, sent to the emergency room, and B, um, with regards to mental health providers, being asked by parents to give them medical clearance letters so that um, the student can return to school. Um, so as a result, one of the first things that we did was we, we put together a Know Your Rights flyer so that um, parents and, um, and community members could be informed about the different rights of um, the, the student and the parent may have in, in the instances when schools want to call 911. Um, this flyer is actually an updated flyer from the original one that we put out back in 2011. Um, and the next thing that we did was to collect data. Certainly, we saw it in our individual cases, and we also we were hearing it from um, you all in the community, but we, we also needed data to um, inform whatever actions we were going to take, because this clearly appeared to be a systemic issue, and, and this could only be addressed on a policy level, and, and to do so, we needed the data. Um, we were able to get data, and it, it largely confirmed um, what we were seeing, uh, on average, there were about 3,800 calls, you know, um, according to the data that we got from the Department of Education. Uh, that was similarly reflected in the data that we got from the Fire Department of New York. Um, one interesting note to, to just point out, uh, the data also suggested that a lot of the calls coming from the New York City public school system were coming from schools that were meant to serve those students with the, the most severe dis disabling conditions. And, and that's the District 75 schools. I'm not sure if people are familiar with that, but District 75 is, is a citywide school district within the New York City public school system that serves um, the most severely disabled students. Um, and, and this was particularly troubling since um, many of us felt that if any school in the New York City school system that should be better prepared and better trained to work with disruptive students, it, it, it should be the District 75 schools. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tara Foster to discuss um, the next step that we took in terms of um, trying to address this issue. Great. Good afternoon, everyone. So um, we filed TH versus Farina. Um, in federal district court, we had 11 student plaintiffs and their parents. Most of the plaintiffs were African American and Latino. Most were five or six years old when they were transported to hospital emergency rooms. And virtually all were from low income and or low income neighborhoods. Um, the defendants in our case were the city of New York, uh, the Department of Education, the fire department, by and through the chancellor and the commissioner. And then, of course, we had a number of unnamed John and Jane Doe's who were the emergency medical technicians who responded and removed the children. I want to point out that, you know, many of these children, as I mentioned, were very, very young. And some of the 
types of examples were things like a kindergarten boy who had been EMS'd five times in the space of a few months. Um, yes, he engaged in disruptive behavior. Sometimes things were pulled off school walls, there was kicking, et cetera, but certainly no medical necessity. And none of the students who were removed to hospital emergency rooms were kept. All were released, released to their parents, even though they spent many, many, many hours of um, talking to different uh, hospital doctors, social workers, et cetera. We brought our claims um, under some of the disability laws. Um, for example, we brought claims under Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, under the Americans with Disabilities Act, under the New York City Human Rights Laws. We also made some claims about illegal seizures, taking these children against their will was um, a Fourth Amendment violation of the United States Constitution and the New York State Constitution. And we made some due process claims based on liberty interests. Um, you know, parents have the right to control the medical um, decisions of their children and also not to be unreasonably separated from their children um, without due process and good reason. Um, I'm going to skip through the next slides. Um, we eventually were able to settle this case with the City of New York. It took many, many, many meetings with not only lawyers, but members of DOE staff and the fire department. And um, we were able to, re um, to secure some pretty uh, important relief, we think. Um, a large portion of the relief was injunctive relief, which means that it was non-monetary. Some of the highlights um, which we hope will bring about systemic change, um, were things like the fact that the DOE had to establish a new policy and protocol for removing children through EMS um, when they're engaged in serious disruptive behaviors. And there's an entire, this has been codified in a chancellor's regulation, A411, which you can find online. Um, also, we think very importantly, there will be huge increases in training and professional development around crisis intervention throughout the city. Um, there is mandated collection and publication of data on EMS use by schools. Uh, there will be increased resources in schools. And there are new mandates surrounding um, fire department's response protocols. Uh, in addition, each and every one of the plaintiffs in this case received some money damages, um, primarily for pain and suffering. Um, but, you know, because for some students, this was quite traumatic. I mean, one of the students was a child with a developmental disability who refused to take off his Halloween mask. He, his mother was one of the few people who actually got called and came out. Her child was locked in a room with his nose pressed up, banging on the door, begging to see his mother, and nobody would let this little boy out. He was seven years old at the time. So it was pretty traumatic stuff that was going on. And um, so we did secure monetary relief, and some of the parents also got relief for lost time at work, et cetera. Um, the Chancellor's regulation is the first time that they're really laying out um, information for parents and staff on how to deal with behavioral crisis de-escalation interventions and when you should contact 911. Um, so staff is going to have more clear guidance on the procedures for using EMS. Um, and also, all schools are going to be required to develop plans to respond to these types of crisis situations. Um, there's some protocols that are in place before calling 911 so that when a student engages be in behavior that poses a substantial risk of serious injury to the student or others, staff have to notify the principal. The parent must be notified and given a chance to speak with the student. We felt this was really important because like in that example that I just gave about the child with a developmental disability, it really would have helped if the parent could have spoken to her child. Um, in most cases, that does help to de-escalate. Um, also, staff must attempt to de-escalate the behavior through use of strategies or resources in the school. They can't just knee-jerk call for um, medical assistance. Um, 
schools, there are instances when schools will need to call 911, and that is when a student's behavior poses an imminent and substantial risk of serious injury to himself or others, and the situation cannot be safely addressed by the school staff. Um, there's some protocols when 911 has called, because sometimes 911 will be called, but the child might be calm, or there might not be a reason to actually transport the child. So when 911 has been called again, the principal must notify the parent that 911 was called. The parent must be given an opportunity to speak with the student if the parent is present at the school or can be reached by phone, unless doing so is going to interfere with 911 responders' duties. In most cases that we saw, it really isn't going to be because the kids aren't actually getting medical attention. Um, so you know there is sensitivity to if you know the child is not breathing and they're you know, that there may be a time that the parent can't speak to the child. But for the most part, that is a step that should be tried. The parent has a uh, parents um, are reminded of their rights in writing in this um, regulation about their right to refuse um, transport to hospitals and to receive medical services from 911 responders. And when that happens, the 911 responders have some protocols that they can go through that we'll, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, if a student is not, in fact, transported uh, to hospital emergency room, then what was happening in the past was that, you know, kids were routinely being sent home, but many times they were quite calm and actually could return to their classroom and not miss out on the day's work. So there will be a discussion with parents and schools to decide whether the child should return to class, whether the parent should take the child home, perhaps the child might see the guidance counselor. If a parent can't be reached um, when 911 has been called, um, what will happen is the 911 responders will confer with school officials and determine if the student needs to be transported. If the student is transported, a school staff member must accompany the student to the hospital if the parent is not present. Um, one of the things that was very important to us um, in looking out for parental rights was to make sure that um, some sort of unspoken things were made clear so that parents could actually point to them in the regulations. So for example, prohibited actions. School staff can't use 911 as a disciplinary response or measure. Uh, discipline is discipline and there's a due process procedure for that and documentation for that. Um, when it is safe to do so, school staff must use alternative de-escalation strategies before using 911. It shouldn't be just a knee-jerk, as Nelson mentioned, that's, you know, it's disruptive, it's traumatic for children, and also, quite frankly, it's expensive and takes away resources from people that may actually have real medical emergencies. Um, school staff may not request or require a mental health clearance letter as a precondition for the student returning school to school. We were seeing this a lot with students even when they weren't sent um, to hospital emergency rooms, instead of using things like the IDEA process or other accommodations or using behavior intervention plans and things like that, schools were often saying, you know, we think your child has ADHD or a conduct disorder and we really think that, you know, your child should just not return to school until you've seen a psychiatrist or a psychologist and have a full clearance. So many children, particularly poor families who don't always have ready access to doctors and clinics, were missing many, many days of school um, just to get these clearance letters, and that is not legal. Um, there is an emphasis in this, um, in the entire settlement, but also in this regulation for positive behavioral interventions. Um, there is a strong preference and requirement for documentation and reporting so that now principals will be notifying the DOE's emergency intake center when 911 is called. And this is in part so that we can track when these occurrences are happening. And so occurrence reports are filed and parents are entitled to get copies of those reports. Um, in every New York City public school now, there will be crisis de-escalation plans and intervention plans. These plans must include strategies for de-escalating behavioral crisis situations. They must identify locations in the school building in which students in crisis may be safely isolated from others. They must identify any school staff trained in de-escalation techniques, whether that's PBIS, TCIS, or other. Um, they must identify in-school and community resources that are available to the school and parents. 
and they must describe how crisis de-escalation and response protocols are going to be communicated to the school staff, because it does you little good if you have these plans in place, but the staff is not aware of it. Um, as part of the settlement, plaintiff's counsel can review up to 75 um, of these crisis de-escalation plans every year, and we can kind of randomly select. And the intent is to look at schools that are doing it right, schools that maybe aren't getting it right, and just see if there's a correlation. Um, this is an example of one of the crisis intervention plans that we were able to get this past March. Um, I'm going to actually skip forward to the second page. I mean, you will see that crisis team leaders are identified and members of the team are identified and folks training is identified, but I wanted to point out, um, you know, a place where we felt this particular plan wasn't exactly what we had in mind. Um, it may be hard to see on your screen, but if you come about a third of the way down the page, it says identify in school and community resources that are available to the school and parents. Um, here, the first item that's listed is the local police department. <laughs> also listed is Elmer's Hospital, Queen's Hospital, and Queen's Child Guidance Count, uh, Center. This wasn't exactly what we had in mind. Yes, um, Queen's Child Guidance Center is one out of four um, places that are listed, but um, frankly, police departments don't provide mental health or other supports. And we fear that that actually um, increases the whole already oversubscribed use of the school to prison pipeline. So this would be a plan that we want to maybe discuss with the city about how they could improve it and have better lists um, of resources for parents and school members. Moving ahead, I'm going to talk a little bit about the crisis intervention teams. They, of course, are tasked with helping to de-escalate incidents of student behavior. Um, they are tasked with making sure that orientation is conducted for school staff, including non-instructional staff, which is really important because sometimes school cafeteria workers or school safety agents could really use some instruction in this area. Um, again, they will be identifying in school and community resources. Um, very quickly, because we are short on time, um, I did want to remind people that the fire department does have their own EMS regulations and that parents do have a right to refuse medical aid or assistance. Um, and some of the new mandates for the EMS providers are that they will speak to parents in person or by phone if the parent requests it, and it's not interrupting um, the, the service provider. Um, in a significant way, like if they're administering um, medical assistance. Um, furthermore, um, if the school identifies the person as the parent and speaks with the parent, um, they won't intervene with their duties. I, I wanted to move forward to um, the standards under which um, EMS usually will take a student is when the students have a condition that can't, so uh, I'm sorry, let me step back. Parents can override taking a child to a hospital emergency room if they are there, provided that the child is not in a life-threatening or life-altering situation and the student can be released to a safe environment. So if the EMS personnel has a question or is not really clear on whether that's the situation, they can contact the fire department doctors and revisit, and they can, in fact, override a parent's wishes in those circumstances. Um, one of the most important um, aspects of this settlement was the escalation training for DOE staff. Um, over three years, 1,500 new staff members will receive training in therapeutic crisis intervention, so that will be 500 each year of the three-year settlement period. Um, all of you are probably far better versed than I in therapeutic crisis intervention for schools, but TCIS is a crisis prevention and intervention model for schools that was created by Cornell University. The training focuses on preventing and de-escalating de crisis situations with students. Um, it deals with processing the crisis event with the student to help improve their coping strategies. It deals with managing crisis situations to reduce the risk of harm to students and staff. 
creating teams to help prevent, de-escalate, and manage acute crisis, and increasing knowledge and skills on the part of school personnel to handle crisis effectively. So we feel like this is really helpful and meaningful. Um, we ha will have a list each year given to us by DOE of the top schools with the highest rates of EMS transports, and those schools will get additional support um, and staff trained in crisis de-escalation. The idea was what we wanted to deal with the schools with the most need. Um, we have a list this year. These are schools that are designated schools as we go into the 2016-17 school year, and it was compiled based on data from last year. Um, going forward, schools will be doing better documentation of when EMS is called and when children are transported, and we will be getting reports. Um, in particular, every six months, we will be getting uh, the total numbers from each school of EMS calls for disruptive student behavior and EMS transports. We will also be getting district-wide data, which will include the number of calls and the number of transports, but it will be broken out by race, IEP status, and age. And for those who are not familiar, IEPs are individualized education plans for students in special education. Uh, the fire department will also be reporting um, every six months and giving us the same information on transports and calls. Um, we felt it was important to kind of cross-reference um, just to see, just to keep everybody honest. Um, again, the stipulation period will be three years long and uh, the monitoring will end in June of 2018. I want to talk a little bit about next steps. It's really important to us to continue a dialogue with schools, open it up more broadly to health providers, parents, students, advocates, and other community stakeholders. We're trying very hard to analyze and share the data that we've collected, and we're hoping to build on some of the school climate changes in this administration so that we can promote more inclusive and disability and trauma sensitivity in school environments that our, these children are um, attending, you know, that really helps us get, provide the promise of equal educational opportunity for all children. Um, as we move forward, you know, it's not really a great surprise to us that high-needs communities generally have more rates of EMS usage. Um, you know, often these communities serve students' populations with significant socioeconomic and social-emotional needs, um, public schools and high-needs communities often have few viable options or resources to respond to youth in crisis, and often administrators and staff have limited training. I mean, as you'll see in a moment when we look at some of the maps, you know, some of these places are parts of the city where there's high turnover rates, younger teachers, and less resources. So we have taken the data that we've collected over the first year and a half of reporting, and you know, not surprisingly, the larger bubbles are where there are larger numbers of calls um, to EMS responders from schools. And, you know, not surprisingly, this breaks down pretty much as we suspected that there are higher proportions of calls in higher poverty neighborhoods, in areas where there's more homelessness, in areas where there are more referrals for abuse and neglect, in areas where there's higher instances of foster care, in areas where there's higher crime density. I know that you all don't need to hear this, but I think it's important for us to keep the dialogue going that adverse environments resulting from and chronic poverty, neglect, abuse, violence, domestic and violence, all can have toxic effects on children can in fact disrupt brain architecture and impair the development of executive function. Executive function and self-regulation skills are mental processes that help us to plan and focus attention, remember instruction, control impulses, juggle tasks. We, um, we often see kids who may have been misdiagnosed um, by, and quite frankly, sometimes by school personnel who really don't have the authority or the ability to diagnose sometimes providers too, you know, they're dealing in a rush and some of the symptoms look like things like ADHD. When you combine kids who've had trauma in their life 
um, but also may have a learning disability or a communication disorder or a developmental disorder, you know, this complicates things further. So we think it's really important to have an understanding of trauma and how it impacts student behavior and to be sensitive to it. Um, I'm going to now turn it over to Nelson. We know that the issues that we've seen in this litigation are not unique to New York. We know that the responses across the country have been similar, and so I turn it over to Nelson to wrap up. Thank you, Tara. Um, so as, as I mentioned at the outset, um, <clears throat> school discipline and, and responses to disruptive students is is a national issue, and, um, and it, it is arguably one of the biggest issues facing any school personnel, um, especially in low-income neighborhoods. Um, and the National <clears throat> Education Agency, NEA, um, they too uh, recognize that this is a significant problem, and they've issued guidelines um, trying to uh, advise teachers to take a more of a, you know, I, I would say a trauma light informed <laughs> approach to um, responding to, uh, to disruptive students. Um, and on top of that, we, we have a number of high profile incidents, uh, some of them as recently as last year that uh, sort of reflect upon how um, it, it is a significant issue when students do become disruptive that schools oftentimes do not take the right approach to responding to that disruptive student. Uh, certainly the, the example that I'm, I'm talking about now about the incident in South Carolina, I think we've all seen that video where the school resource officer, it's actually a police officer, um, tries to remove a high school student from the classroom an African-American female student and places her in a chokehold and, and throws her to the ground. Um, that case uh, probably tip of, is, is a typical case where students um, do get involved with the police uh, when schools are trying to um, effectuate discipline in their classrooms. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, uh, that is typically how a lot of schools um, throughout the country respond to disruptive students. Uh, oftentimes, if they, if they can't find the student is responsive to uh, school staff trying to de-escalate the situation, oftentimes they will call in the police. Um, so the use of EMS and the use of hospital emergency rooms uh, typically is, is not as, as big of an practice outside of New York City, it, it appears, but, but it has happened in other jurisdictions as well. There, there was um, a specific case that was discussed in, in a book by some um, Massachusetts hospital emergency room doctors. They talked about an eight-year-old boy that was sent to their emergency room by the child's school. And again, for, for much, much of the same um, concerns that we've talked about in the past where they thought that simply because his drawing seemed to suggest that he may want to hurt the teacher that, that he needed to be sent to the hospital emergency room. Um, <clears throat> there was a recent case in upstate New York where New York State Police got involved in a, in a situation involving a five-year-old student with special needs. Um, another situation where he, the child was being disruptive and um, the school felt it was uh, necessary to call in police, and the police in turn took him to, to the hospital emergency room for psychiatric evaluation. Um, <clears throat> then there are other types of inappropriate police responses where an eighth grade student was um, tasered uh, in Virginia. Then um, there was another student, another high school student taken to a hospital emergency room in Farmington, Maine. Um, for, again, being disruptive. Um, I did also want to mention uh, this fairly important lawsuit that has, uh, that, that was recently filed um, last year in Compton, California. Uh, this is potentially a groundbreaking lawsuit that may really put the issue of trauma um, at the forefront 
in um, school districts throughout the country. Uh, essentially, uh, a lawsuit was brought against the Compton Unified School District claiming that um, they failed under Section 504 to provide reasonable accommodations for their, student, their students and their teachers who um, have been severely affected by trauma. Um, the, the lawsuit claims that a lot of the students um, that attend the Compton Unified School District schools have been exposed to high incidence of traumatic events whether it be crime, domestic abuse, um, income insecurity, housing insecurity, um, that these students had a disabling condition under Section 504 and that the schools needed to have provided appropriate accommodations for those students, namely um, having their staff properly uh, trained in, in responding to, to students who, who are been experiencing these traumas. Um, at this point, the, the lawsuit is winding its way through the federal district court. Um, they survived, the, the plaintiffs survived a motion to dismiss, which is important because um, the judge felt that uh, the effects of trauma can rise to a disability. And um, at this point, from what I've heard most recently, uh, the parties are in discussions about potential settlement. So this is an important case to watch. You can learn more about it by going to the link that's provided on the slide. Um, and, and hopefully there is a, a positive outcome to this. And <clears throat> I think as, as we wrap up the presentation here, um, it's, it's important to, it's, it was important for us to bring this lawsuit really to try to address um, a significant problem in, in the public schools where students were getting disruptive and schools for whatever reason felt that they had no other choice than to call for um, emergency service responders. And, um, and again, you know, looking at the, the kids and, and the circumstances where they were coming from, it was easy to understand why these students were getting into situations where they were getting highly dysregulated. And, and our important goal was to try to, through this litigation, through our advocacy, was to try to provide schools with more options, with better resources, so that they can more properly respond to these students. Um, and, and as we talked about before, it, it is our firm belief that a lot of uh, the drivers for these behaviors is the exposure to a toxic environment, to the, the traumas that a lot of these students um, experience uh, on, on almost a near daily basis. And, um, and we hope that not only will the New York City public school system, but, but every school system in the United States, especially when they serve low-income students, um, will move towards increasing access to um, mental health services for students, whether it be um, having on-site school-based mental health clinics or actually having creating uh, partnerships between schools and local uh, mental health providers. Um, it's also highly important that um, as many schools as possible improve their training of their staff around de-escalation and also about becoming more trauma-informed. Um, but we also understand that a lot of these issues um, are, are broader and far more systemic, and, and I think we as a society need to address that as well, um, the, the systemic issues that sort of underlie the, uh, the, the problems that cause the trauma. <laughs> so, as a society, it would be important to address those underlying issues such as unemployment, underemployment, domestic violence, housing instability, food insecurity, racism, and, and particularly in a lot of the urban school districts, segregation. Um, and that is generally our, our presentation. We appreciate you all sitting in and listening to us, and, and I guess we're open to taking questions at this time. 
Um, thank you, Tara and Nelson. And now we are going to begin answering questions submitted during today's presentation. As a reminder, you can still submit questions through the chat box. And um, we have a comment. This has been a pet peeve of mine. Clients who behave quite well outside of school often flip out when school staff confront them repeatedly despite students' need for time out or break. Students and parents then end up in the ER and sometimes psychiatric settings when use of a timeout relaxation techniques or simply listening could have prevented this. Um, and I totally agree with that, <laughs> definitely. We couldn't um, agree so, with the commenter more. <laughs> I know, yep. I, I, I know, definitely. Um, so here's your first question. Have you seen significant improvement in the data since the time of the case and implementation of local regulations? Well, it, it's been a bit of a mixed bag. Um, certainly one, one there, there's been a couple of positives. One of the positives is that there's definitely been an increase in awareness among school staff and uh, school administrators about the need for um, crisis de-escalation and about training around crisis de-escalation. So I've actually heard from um, teachers and, and other staff members that, that there's an acknowledgement about that. Um, <clears throat> we've also seen an, a decrease in the number of calls and the number of transports in the District 75 schools, the schools that I mentioned before that um, actually had the highest numbers from our, from our data that we collected before, uh, those schools have actually shown a decrease. Unfortunately, um, there has been an increase, a slight increase, in the number of calls and the number of transports um, during this last school year. And, um, we're, we're definitely concerned about that. We're looking into it. We're trying to understand it better. A lot of it is happening more in the community schools. So it's not like there's a particularly one school that is driving the increase. Um, it, it appears to be many different schools that are sending kids the, to, to the hospital emergency rooms. Um, <clears throat> so we're, we're looking into that. Okay, so next question. Um, are there specific guidelines on what is imminent threat? That's a great question. <laughs> Definitely. Well, other than the actual definition, no, but imminent means that the very dangerous situation is happening right then and there. And so this was largely important to us, particularly when you got to the point of transfer, because in every single instance, um, the plaintiffs in our case, on every PCR, which is what the EMS people fill out, the child was calm when, when EMS arrived. And so to, uh, clearly that is not imminent. There's no imminent threat whatsoever. Um, it's a good question. I think, you know, there's going to be times when you have to err on the side of caution, but certainly if you've got a six-year-old and they're kicking and screaming, I think you can probably handle that situation. You know, if you've got somebody with a weapon or something, I think, you know, it's a very different situation. We weren't dealing with plaintiffs with those types of stories, but imminent means imminent. <laughs> um, Nelson, do you have anything to add? Yeah, no, I, I think in, in some ways it, it is good to sort of leave it vague because, um, as Tara was mentioning, every situation is, is going to be different and, and there will need to be um, discretion. And so you know also, we're not talking about like suicidality or anything like that. This case was specifically about, you know, behavioral uh, issues. Um, and also that's why it's so important to have the next part which says, and de-escalation isn't working. That's why de-escalation has to happen first because in many cases it just wasn't even happening at all. So one wouldn't know if they even need to place that call in the first instance. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So next question. Could the increase in ER trends in the community schools be due to the fact that additional mental health resources and supports are identifying more situations that legitimately require EMS intervention? That's, that's a good question. Um, again, you know, we've only recently gotten the data uh, that showed the increase, so we're, we're, we're going through it. We're also trying to reach out to, um, to people that we know in, 
within the Department of Education and also um, mental health providers to try to determine, you know, what is exactly driving this. I, I partly suspect that um, because of the regulation that, that came about as a result of our litigation, that that may have um, introduced this potential option to some you know, schools that did, may not have thought about it before. And so certainly this, this could have been an unintended consequence of, of this settlement that some schools who, who may not have ever thought of sending a, a student to the hospital emergency room will now do so partly because um, they've been told that this is an option. And one of the difficulties with the data that we're getting is that we don't know the entire situation. Like, and one of the things we're talking about seeing whether we can do in camera with the city is to actually look more, but because of privacy reasons, even though there's no way we're really gonna be able to figure out who these children are, it, it's hard for us to know. We know that there was some disruptive incident. We know that EMS was called, but we don't, we don't know just from this reporting what the specifics were. And we thought it might be actually useful in schools where there were big increase, you know, if there was an increase in a few schools or districts to maybe get more information, even if it was information that we couldn't share so that we could get a sense. Because, you know, I mean, it's a very good question. If you have a big national tragedy or something going on, there may be more instances of dysregulated behavior and it may be, there may be a pattern of it, or there may be more instances of, you know, mental health issues. But it's a little bit hard the way the data is being reported to us right now, so we're trying to work on that. And if folks have other suggestions, that's really useful to us. Okay, so someone has said, a school in the Bronx is interested in receiving TCI training. However, Cornell doesn't have the training available in New York City. Is there another organization or agency that can provide that training? Um, well, TCIS is actually um, being uh, used in New York City. Uh, that, that was actually part of, as Tara mentioned in her part of the presentation, that that is um, an element of our settlement that New York City is going to train um, 500 staff members each year in the therapeutic crisis in schools program through Cornell um, University. Uh, there are certainly other de-escalation programs. Um, if, if the school is interested in um, trying to access those programs and, and they want to find out ways to do it, they should probably reach out to their borough you know, field offices. Um, where where they can get I guess a direction as how to how to make that happen. I, I don't know personally how how they would access that, but they certainly should reach out to either their superintendent or the borough field office. And I also just wanted to add to that that you know when you have school buy-in like that, that's fantastic. And you know it really works so much better when it's just not a few random people trained in a particular and deployed to a particular school. If you can get a school that really wants to buy into this, I think they need to it needs to start from the top with the principals and the APs, and you know, and we'll try to find out where there's other training. We know that U of T is actually pretty hooked into the different um, trainers in these areas. Okay, so um, I know the time is all is winding down. I have several more questions, but I'm going to pick a few of them. One of them is: um, Is the A411 mandates applicable to publicly funded charter schools? No, uh, unfortunately, this only applies to New York City public schools. Okay. Okay. Is there a sense that it's needed in the, can we throw a question back out? Is there a sense from the audience that it's needed in the um, publicly well, funded charter schools? Well, it, it, that's probably a rhetorical question from Tara because it is, it is necessary right. in the charter right. schools. Yep. It is. <laughs> I, would, so I just wondered if the audience agreed. Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I, I would agree. Okay, and I was told that this should be the last question, but I, I, this one question definitely I think needs to be thrown out. Um, what about disruptive behavior on the bus? We have several cases of incidents on the bus that have been escalated. Uh, well, I mean, that, that, that's, that's a good question. And, you know, um, schools have the ability to respond to um, 
disruptive behaviors, violations of the discipline code that occur on the school bus. Um, they can suspend, they can, um, you know, you know, use other guidance interventions as well. Uh, in terms of using EMS, again, that would probably, um, 8411 would apply as well, you know, that they, they would have to make those determinations. It, it's going to be a little complicated because um, school officials are not on that bus, and it's the bus matron and the, and the bus driver who are working for a subcontractor. Um, I mean, they're a subcontractor from the DOE, so uh, it, it, it's going to be complicated. But that's a good question, and we should probably do some research on that. And I think the other thing is it, it's the same types of issues. Very, very often what you'll find with a child like that is if there's something that's going that's just regulating them on the bus, probably additional supports and services such as a bus para, such as, you know, plans are going to help. So to the extent the kid can get to school and it's not so imminent that they have to stop the bus and call 911, one would hope that you'd go through some of these same de-escalation, try to get a, give the kid a cooling off period, try to figure out what was going on. Um, but yes, in many, many cases, this can be prevented in the future uh, through supports and services. So the person with that question, if they can email either Tara or myself directly, um, I, I would be interested in following oh, up yeah. on that. All right. Well, again, um, before um, we end everything, I just want to remind people that all the presentation materials, including the presentation slides and the webinar recording, will be made available on the Zero Degrees of Separation, the Role of Social Determinants page, on our website at www.ctatny.org. And again, I want to thank Tara and Nelson and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Again, if you have any other questions, please contact ctat.info at nyu.edu. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation, and we would appreciate it if you would complete that and provide your feedback. On behalf of McSilva, CTAT, and MCTAT, and our presenters, thank you so much for taking the time for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.